When you think of movie stars, you probably think of Klieg lights and limousines, champagne and caviar, palm trees and swimming pools, and all the backstage excitement of lights, cameras, and clapboards. Most of us have grown up envying the outward success of movie stars, their glamorous good looks, and their life of external extravagance. It's all very attractive on the outside, but what's the movie star's life like on the inside? What are their feelings about what they do and what it's done to them? Well, right now, we're going to get some answers to those questions from the people who know both sides of stardom. Marlon Brando and Richard Burton and Paul Newman all have some unexpected revelations to make. George C. Scott will explain his desire to drop out, and Warren Beatty will admit more than he usually does. The other side of life in Hollywood for females is a story in itself. Liza Minnelli, Faye Dunaway, and Ellen Burstyn will tell that story. We'll see film clips of performances the stars loved most and some they hated. But mostly we'll see what life is really like on the other side of stardom. A movie star is merely an instrument being used to serve a purpose, just as you and I are used to serve some purpose in the work we do. But I've always wondered how the stars feel about some of the purposes they serve and how their personalities are affected by this process of acting out lives that aren't really their own and speaking lines that someone else has written. One of Hollywood's most accomplished actors, George C. Scott, recently announced that the process had gotten to be too much for him. He says his long career of playing roles has been destructive to his family life and damaging to his personality. So he's decided to quit acting altogether. A sad decision that means we'll be missing some of the most powerful acting the movie screen has ever known. We can produce birth ectogenetically. We can practically clone people like carrots. And half the kids in this ghetto haven't even been inoculated for polio. We have established the most enormous medical entity ever conceived, and people are sicker than ever. The only way I can get out of the doghouse is to do something spectacular. I've got to get back in the war. I don't see no gun toting women lined up behind you. Something got to me and my sheep, and it killed my boy. Now the army's all over my ranch. I want to know what happened. Being two people or three people, how many you want to be, that, uh, that helps you get out of yourself, which is beneficial to actors, in my opinion. Some actors don't agree with that. But uh, there can, can come a time when uh, being uh, continually a split personality over a number of years can have a very wearing effect on one's psyche. Mm -hmm. What are some of those effects? Oh, uh, strangely enough, uh, there is a sense of loneliness about acting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sense of being cut off from the rest of society. Particularly, the more one succeeds, the more one cut off, mm -hmm. cut off one becomes. Mm -hmm. For instance, I used to be able to go out and look at human beings and study them and judge them. I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. There's another thing, people don't behave the same way around you that they yes. would normally. Yeah, that's true. So you, there's a constant feeling of being squeezed off into a corner, uh, socially speaking. I, I think that George uh, Scott is right, you know. Uh, he's a very highly intelligent man. And one of the things I think that you should be, uh, if you're going to be an actor, an established one, and a powerful one uh, in your various ways, is not to be intelligent. I think that acting should only be for females, really. <laughs> uh, because they're the only people... Uh, you remember what uh, Jean Renoir said? Uh, he said that all actors are homosexuals. Mm -hmm. And he may be right. Uh, I'm not, therefore I'm not an actor. <laughs> But of course, Burton is an actor. It's just that he's become a very reluctant actor, except when he has really strong material to work with, as he did in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. So I know what we'll do. How about a little round of Get the Guests? How about that? How about a little game of Get the Guests? Jesus, George. Book dropper, child mentioner. I don't, I don't like these games. No, I, I, no, no, we've only had one game. Now we've got to have another. You can't fly on one game. Anyway, Silence! Now, how are we going to play Get the Guests? You be quiet. I wonder, I wonder. There haven't been enough dynamic moments for Richard Burton, though, and like George C. Scott, Burton, too, has felt the urge to quit acting. And I've thought a few times and I've, uh, about uh, stopping it and so on, uh, but I'm not entirely sure whether I could. You know, the, the bug of uh, acting is a very deep bite, and uh, when it's taken away from you, who knows, you might uh, 
die or something like that. I don't know. Uh, certainly, I don't know. But um, there is a certain quality about uh, acting which is um, uh, purely demanding and powerful. And I'm not entirely sure whether I could stop it, but I would like to, I must say. After seeing his last movie, The Klansman, I'm sure Burton wishes he had quit. The Klansman was such a shabby film that it surely marks the low point in the career of an actor who does possess greatness. But Burton has had to suffer through more than one shabby film in the nine years since Virginia Woolf. Remember Bluebeard and Hammersmith is out? The question is, why does an actor of Burton's stature have to act in such junk? Now, I think I've uh, degenerated in a funny way. Uh, I withdraw from the role, uh, whatever I'm playing. I've played virtually everything that any man of my age can, can play. If you're lucky as an actor, um, you can get perhaps two pictures out of ten that work, that are artistically successful and commercially successful. It's very, very difficult to find. Obviously, Burton isn't the only star with that problem. Quite a few of Hollywood's finest find themselves totally frustrated by the apparent conflict between artistic values and commercial values. And if that's not enough of a predicament, they also have to deal with their own limitations as actors. When I talked with Paul Newman, for example, he was celebrating his 20th anniversary as a film actor. And he, too, offered a self-evaluation that few stars would be willing to reveal. I think acting was a good deal more exciting, you know, 20 years ago. Mostly because you... I didn't feel it a, as a person that I had exhausted any supply of, uh, of characterizations. Mm -hmm. And now, 20 years later, you find that... It, there are only so many different facets of your own personality that you can get to and you find yourself repeating yourself. So it's, mm. I mean, there are actors like Olivier and Guinness who are extraordinary mm -hmm. and who seem to have a limitless... Uh, yeah, their reservoir, it goes... Incredible. Yeah, and yeah. I don't seem to have that. Yeah. So uh, I'm not complaining or whining about it. I'm just... Mm, I recognize the fact that it exists. I associate you so much with, with serious, thoughtful movies, the Tennessee Williams things, HUD, Hustler, and so forth, yet it's been uh, a, a while. Yes, there is. I, I wish they were around. But now there's very, very little original work being done. There's very, very little serious work being done in Hollywood today. They're all capers. And they're all really entertaining films. I think that developed long before The Sting came out. Oh, sure. All of your caper films are basically that. Yeah, that's true. I think the, the trend for escapist films is, is going to be here with us for a long while. Yeah. In the 53 and the early 60s, I mean, there were serious films being made. Is, is there one, one of all those great roles that you hold somehow near and dear to your heart that stands out? Not really, and people don't understand this. When you get a, a role like The Hustler, uh, the part really is almost always there. And it doesn't take much to magnify those kind of characters. Very good shot. You know, I got a hunch, fat man. I got a hunch it's me from here on in. One ball, corner pocket. I mean, that ever happened to you? All of a sudden you feel like you can't miss? I wish that the, uh, that the public were willing to see films of some consequence, of some social meaning, mm -hmm. they, some sense of drama, I guess. And they're very limited now. So it makes your thing a little less exciting when you're... Well, there's no question about it. The, the actor has to work. Mm -hmm. If I worked uh, at really only the projects that I was... had a, you know, a total 100% commitment and enthusiasm for, I'd probably work once every three or four years. Really? Yeah, the actor has to work. We, we hear that a lot. But for you personally, at this point, you don't really have to work anymore, do you? I mean, even psychologically, you have to work constantly? To do well, as I say, I, I really want to work. I think, uh, I think the actor, I think any human being that, uh, that has no sense of productivity is likely to become senile very quick. Mm -hmm. Lee. Yeah.
It's one thing for actors to be complaining about the lack of substance in the films they're making, but actresses have had an even worse time of it in recent years. They've had difficulty finding pictures to work in at all. Screenwriters just haven't been writing very many starring women's roles, which is why we haven't seen Liza Minnelli in a movie since she won the Best Actress Oscar for Cabaret back in 1973. He's a cabaret old chum. It's only a cabaret old chum. But there was, there was a, a kind of path that I wanted to follow after Cabaret, which was pure entertainment. Now, that can be making people cry or making them laugh. It's always best if you have both. So I waited and kind of waited, and I found that almost every script I got was uh, a script where the female, was, the female lead was totally, uh, dramatically dependent upon the fella. And I remember one I got that I really liked, and I called up just out of curiosity. I wasn't being smart or, or um, you know, like ha-ha or whatever and i said what if you reversed it what if it's the girl who goes out and does all those you know things and runs around and jumps at the top and the guy waits in the alley and they thought i was joking like that's impossible I said, well, it was just an idea and hung up thinking oh my god they think that i'm crazy but why aren't women why aren't women important anymore it seems, though, like with the success of Cabaret, the Oscar and all that, uh, you would have gotten so much power and leverage that you'd be the last person to be suffering from the lack of good female roles. Leverage for what? To demand that somebody write you a good role, for example. But that's what it had to come down to. <laughs> yeah. For um, a while, I just kind of waited around, you know, and did what I do. I did my show and stayed at home and there, you know, read and worked on my art and so forth. And it suddenly occurred to me that maybe uh, in this day and age where people are creating their own films, all the men, the women should do the same. So we had meetings and there's, oh, yes, it'll be wonderful and there's a two-picture deal at this studio and you can have... But you find it's very difficult. I've asked a few writers, a few screenwriters about it. And one of them said a good, an interesting thing, Charles Eastman. And he said that, I said, why are they, why, Charlie, why, do you, why aren't writers writing them? And he said, well, I think that men, who are most, most of the writers are men, don't really know what women are anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true, obviously, that, you know, since the whole... Um, Rule of liberation, liberation the revolution. There has been, you know, I mean, it happens often, but this is, there's been a big one in the last few yes, years. Right. And I think that the intense, the mainstream of the intensity of it is, is going to create very interesting peripheral changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, um, that women are going to come out with a new position that nobody can really predict. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with Chinatown, it's, um, it's coming at a time when there aren't that many women's stories or, or love stories. It was a very nice throwback, I thought, in a way. But, in, in, you know, the, the, those arrows are coming back. There's going to be some very interesting hap things happening, I think, with female th roles. Did you have affairs? Uh, Mr. Gitties. Did he know about it? Well, I wouldn't run home and tell him every time I went to bed with someone, if that's what you mean. You were seeing someone, too? For very long? I don't see anyone for very long, Mr. Giddies. It's difficult for me. I'd love to see some movies developed, and I think that this will ultimately happen, you know. But what really a woman is, yeah. as opposed to what a man is, they're both people. Yeah. You know, but not anything that is, like, a, you know, angry or, or you know, it's, it's uh, just... And I think that's going to happen, because I think that it's died a little bit down the furor yeah. of, the, of the movement. True. Sure. And I think that that's necessary for any revolutionary movement, but I think that, that it's going to, you know, it's going to switch just what's really happening. I think Faye Dunaway's hope is already becoming a reality. Hollywood is finally beginning to recognize the woman's movement with a whole wave of pictures expressing the concept that women are capable of more and deserve more than the stereotypical slavery of housewife, shopper, mistress, and maid. Actress Ellen Burstyn is the first brilliant star of the new wave in Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, the story of a housewife and mother trying to realize her own potential as a person and her lifelong ambition to be a singer. An empty smoke dream that has gone, gone. Thank you. Well, that, that was...
wasn't really very good. I know I was kind of nervous. I mean, auditions are hard, you know. And I... You'll go for the piano for the first month. Sure. Besides the thrill of being in the forefront of the new wave, Ellen Burstyn is one movie star who really relishes the acting process. It's about awareness and, and uh, being aware of your own feelings and other people's feelings and how people express their feelings and uh, kind of learning to read body language. And you just are doing it all the time, you know. And it, it always seems to me that, that in life we all pretend and then in acting, you stop pretending. It's like a reverse. You actually take off the mask when you act. I want to sing. I want to be a singer. I am a singer. And anything I do from now on has got to include that. How good are you? Well, I'm as good as I am. That's how good I am. That sounds like one hell of a gamble to me. You sure it's worth it? Yes. <clears throat> yes. I am, definitely. Yes. Well, it took Hollywood four or five years to catch up with the woman's movement, so I guess it's doubtful that the movies will pick up on this country's ever-changing political consciousness any quicker. Warren Beatty is one actor who wasn't going to wait around for the movies to catch up with the political times, though. So in the midst of his Bonnie and Clyde success, Beatty quit acting for nearly three years to work in the George McGovern campaign of 1972. Beatty brought his political awareness with him when he came back to Hollywood, first as an investigative reporter in the Parallax View, and then in Shampoo as a Beverly Hills hairdresser, living with the idle rich in a world of personal corruption and political apathy, concerns that are far more important to Beatty than acting. Well, I don't think of myself too much as an actor anyway. You don't? Not really. I think of myself as somebody who gets interested in certain ideas or projects and then uh, carries them out. It's impossible to make a movie without some sort of underlying or political moment to it. Every movie's political. NBC News now projects Nixon's the winner in South Carolina. We'll restore respect for the United States of America. And let's make one thing very clear. In our administration, the American flag will not be a doormat for anybody. Beatty says he enjoyed making shampoo, but if he can't find future projects with some relevance, he's likely to once again vanish from the screen for a couple of years. Because Beatty is one movie star who rejects the idea of movie making for its own sake. I feel that you have only one life, really, and, and uh, you're not going to come back. You know, I'm not going to get to come back as a newscaster. And you're not going to come back as a movie actor or something, I don't think. And, uh, and I just, I, I wouldn't want all that time to go by and just make movies. I mean, really, movies, it's, it's, you know, it's the same lights and sets, and it's, you know, you're really trying to say something about the world outside, or, or, or say something about the way you feel, and you can't do that by just making movies over and over and over again. I mean, you can look pretty, and you can be, uh, or you can try to look pretty, and you can uh, try to be uh, funny or successful or some silly thing, but it, it, it's not really very rewarding once you've made some money. I don't think that it's, I don't think it's any way to spend all your time. Marlon Brando also has his doubts about movie acting as a way to spend all his time. Brando's more dedicated to helping the American Indian than he is to movie making. In fact, he hasn't even seen the performance that won him the Oscar he refused. What have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? If you'd come to me in friendship, and the scum that ruined your daughter would be suffering this very day. Brando maintains he will not watch The Godfather because he says he was told the picture would be a critique of American capitalism, but he feels it didn't turn out that way. He hasn't given up, though. Now Brando is more determined than ever to do what he can to put the movie industry to better use, and he says he'll keep acting for that reason only. As a means to an end, it's uh, a useful profession. There is this question of whether or not uh, you, you can use your end to, for ill or for good. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, is up to argument, because what is good for Goldwater is not good for uh, uh, someone else. What makes sense to John Wayne is not, uh, doesn't encompass my view. So it's, uh, it's a race with one wall and another wall to the corner. Now, do you find that within Hollywood you can use your power and, and whatever influence you have to 
get a different kind of picture made? You can use it, but uh, how good is it? Uh, you know, is, is it any good? Only history is going to tell that. Yeah. History is going to tell. Where was the movie industry? Where was I when the Vietnam War was going on? I was saying I was going through some philosophical dilemmas and... You were and the Godfather, huh? I was, no, it was, it was uh, before that. Yeah. But uh, I was going through some numbers, getting myself together and uh, trying to think of, well, you know, what do I really feel about this and that and the other thing? But uh, in spite of me, where was the, uh, where was the movie industry? Ignoring it. The Green Berets. John Wayne. At least John Wayne was out front. Mm -hmm. I mean, insanely uh, devoted to this jingoist view of the world. He nevertheless put his money where his mouth is. You've got to give him credit for that because he acts on his beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, but where were the rest of us? Down in the cellar eating sauerkraut. Where are you now, though? That's well, I'm making a picture about the American Indian, which I think... Uh, tells uh, about the compromise that we've made with ourselves mm -hmm. in relation to uh, our ethics. I've always tried to, in some, you know, perhaps hopeless or silly, uh, ineffectual way, try to inject a, some kind of note into the pictures that I was, I was in. Some were real stinkers, and, uh, you know, I've spent most of the time in the business just doing pictures as a business. But in trying to select pictures, I've always sort of tried to shave it, uh, which I think perhaps is not enough at this time because we don't have enough time now. And if we don't use our, our instruments, if we don't use our networks, if we don't use our motion pictures to promote a sense of brotherhood, to try to find the common denominator of what our problems are with one another, why you should hate me because you're Irish and Catholic and I happen to be Irish and Protestant. If we don't solve those problems, if we don't solve the problems of production, if we don't start using all our forces and our capacities as communicators. If we don't, the future looks bleak. But even in Hollywood, there are a few people trying to use their capacities to promote a sense of brotherhood. And that, too, is another side of stardom. For other sides of life backstage in Hollywood, I hope you'll join me a few weeks from now for another look behind the scenes. Super Coney Hollywood They come from Chillicothe and Paducahs With their bazookas to get their names up in lights